You may not have a direct connection to an art director or the art director you want to have the connection with, but you have connections to some people somewhere with some kind of job that you could be doing. Good morning guys, it's me. Happy Monday. I hope you guys had an amazing weekend. I had a wonderful weekend. I did not work at all, and this is the first weekend in a long time that I got to do that. So I'm coming into this this morning and this week. I'm feeling pretty pretty fresh and refreshed, and I don't know why I don't learn why I spend so many weekends working for a, the better part of the weekend when I know better, when I know that I can... I can actually come in more productive and more refreshed on Monday if I just take the time off. And so it was a good weekend. And I should say that I'd say normally, usually I do take the weekend off. I mean, that is my policy. I don't accept Monday deadlines for that very reason. So I don't have to work all weekend. But March and April are very typically super busy months for me and so I kind of lose touch with my ideals and not even just lose touch with them I just have to put them aside so I can get the work done and I get into just survival mode rather than being more in control of, of my life so yeah I guess I just kind of jumped right into that eh um yeah I thought I'd just I like starting these videos off with a little bit of chit chat and I'm not sure if, if you guys listen to these videos or watch these videos for the chit chat or if you like just jumping to the part where I answer the questions. But I guess the way I think about it is that um, a lot of us are in our studios just drawing or sketching or illustrating or doing whatever we're doing. And it's nice to he hear other illustration related things so if you're, whether it's a podcast or or whatever so and I've heard from some of you guys that you like to just listen to this uh, while you're doing those things so that's that's my intent if I'd love to know if you guys would rather me just rather that I just jump to the the question content where I actually just get down to the nitty-gritty or if you're happy to hear me chit chat a little bit about my own musings at the beginning and uh, that would help me understand kind of you guys as my audience and and understand how to make better content but as it stands i will i will carry on with my chit chat so yeah my weekend of no work was awesome um i gotta say last week was one of the hardest weeks of the year uh if not an even longer period and i think it was because i took on one too many jobs i was already at like my limit and a client came to me, they kept coming back to me and wanting to work with me. And so after a few times, I felt maybe compelled, obligated, because they seemed like a great client, um, interesting illustration projects up my alley. And I didn't want to let them down if they came to me so many times. Maybe that would have been the last time I turned them down and then they'd never come back. So I, I do like to honor people who seek me out specifically. As an illustrator, you want to be sought out as an individual illustrator with a unique style versus, you know, being a generic illustrator that is replaceable. So anyway, I value that and I, I took it on. I So one thing about taking that project on is they were offering um, what I consider a low fee, uh, a low fee that uh, compared to what, I, what I've been able to get lately. So I told them that, in order to make it work, I would need to raise the, the fee per illustration. And we so, sort of went back and forth and we agreed to, um, it was in pounds. So it, was, it ended up being, I think, 100 pounds over what they were asking, which st it, it sounds crazy, but it was still wasn't what I was hoping to get per image, especially because I had so, many, so much work already. And when you have a lot of work at the same time, your time becomes 
becomes rarer and scarcer. It so you, you think about like Uber surge pricing, like when there's more demand, then the price can go up. And I think that's the same with creative. If you're in demand and more people are asking for you, your resources are more scarce. You have to spread them out more thinly, I guess. And and the value of your time goes goes up. So you can you can justify asking for more. So anyway, that's what I did. I asked for more. I got more. And so when I got more, I was hoping that they would they would say, oh, we, we can't match your price, but they did, and or at least met me kind of halfway. And so after all the work of trying to get the price up and then succeeding, I, I had to take the work, right? I didn't, there, there would have been no point in that conversation unless I was willing to take on the work. So I took on the work and it put me over the edge. It was insane. So the, 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 I can't really talk about the specifics right now because it's fairly recent and um, yeah, just not, it's, it's, it's still a little bit raw and needs some time before, before I can talk about the specifics. But let's just say it was, it was a, a, a subject of illustration that I was really into in concept, in theory. But when I started trying to do the sketches, I just couldn't, I, I had so much trouble creating ideas, coming up with ideas and sketches that, that kind of met what I felt like the client was expecting and what I w expected of myself. And it, it, I probably spent 30 to 40 hours just on sketches. Like I was really in a bad place. And this is while I'm overbooked. So I'm really getting in trouble in terms of how much time I'm spending on things. And I'm kind of falling short on other deadlines and and that's not good when you're actually falling short on deadlines and you're a professional. So I, I was in a very dark place, not feeling so great about myself as an illustrator, as a, uh, as a person, because I was letting, you know, clients were counting on me down. I was letting them down. My studio was a mess. I had no idea uh, what, what, like, I, I, I lost touch with my schedule with my calendar so people in terms of planning for the future I, I just felt very like stuck in tunnel vision and um, not a good place and so obviously I had to work through it there's no there's no kind of I couldn't get out of it so I had to do something otherwise I mean the option was break down and, and just skip town on everyone or try and solve the problem so I had to do a few things I had to look at the client work that was maybe less a priority or clients that I thought that maybe could give me a little bit more extra time and I contacted them and basically asked for mercy I said is it possible if we can move this deadline ahead a little bit and usually when when you ask that and it's not a rush job the clients willing to to work with you a little bit especially if you're being honest about it so that's one thing you can do is if you're in a time crunch you know in the worst case scenario you can always ask for mercy it's better to ask for mercy ahead of time than to just miss a deadline and have a client who's really angry who is counting on you and it's still not ideal but it's it's at least a way of showing some honesty and transparency that will get you more respect than the alternative you know when you're 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 trying to come up with ideas but you don't you're not ready to show anyone yet because you don't like any of them and you're afraid that someone else's input will further malign you and complicate the process and 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 throw you back to the beginning and and i had to sort of say no i need to show someone these sketches to get me out of my head and so of course my my wife amanda is always amazing for that and so i showed her all my sketches and of course she can see in the work what I'm not able to see in the moment and she was able to encourage me and help me pick what is working and what's not working or at least give me feedback and then I could decide for myself what was working or not working and and so that helped me kind of focus my sketches a little bit and then yeah I mean at the end of the day I had to I had to there there was a time limit and I had to come up with some sketches 
that I showed the client. And so I just said, this is what it's gonna be. Whatever I think in my head might be, whatever this great idea that I'm hoping will end up on these pages, but isn't, that doesn't exist, it's a fiction. There is no better than this right now. I have to work with what I've made because whatever I'm hoping to get, maybe I'll get there in the final illustration, but I have to show some sketches now and, and we need to work from there. And, that, and, and so that's what I did, sent, sent them to the client. The client loved the sketches and we went into finals. So that's great. So I was gonna say something about the actual sketches. Oh yeah, one of the things I, I was struggling with in the sketches was, was just like, cause I'm always thinking about, and I said this in my last, I think I said this in my last video. I try to make my sketches work well for how I will illustrate it. So I, I wanna see exactly how I'm gonna illustrate it or I wanna make sure that whatever I sketch will actually turn out well as an illustration. Cause sometimes I do a sketch and then when it comes to actually making it the actual finished illustration, it, it, it doesn't, things don't align in the way that I, would, I had hoped. So anyway, I was getting really stuck on that. Like how can I make these sketches as close to the final illustration as possible so I can just go in and, and make them awesome at the final art stage. And of course, that almost is, there's a point where you, you can try to make the sketch look too much like the illustration in which like it defeats the point of the sketch, which is supposed to be faster and, and um, not as committed just in case the client needs changes or wants you to do another one. Anyway, client liked the sketches. Then I spent all of last weekend just fleshing them out in final art and it turned out great. I'm actually really happy with them. They're, they're um, some of the strongest illustrations I've done this year. So I'm happy I overcame. And then after I did that, I came and looked around my studio and it was so messy. I was just like, there's dirt on the floor from like my boots tracking and mud. There was paper all over my, um, paper and ink and garbage all over my desktop. There was apple cores on the floor and orange peels. It looked like Oscar the Grouch's, if Oscar the Grouch had like a, a house in his garbage can, I, maybe he did, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I watched Sesame Street, but it was pretty disgusting. And um, cleaned up my room, cleaned up my studio, and I just, you just do that. Just clean your studio uh, when it's been messy for a long time makes you feel sane and, and like, oh, okay, I, I think I can, I think I can breathe a little more. I think, I think I can move forward a bit. So I did that. And I also took a look at my schedule and I, I made a, a grid of the weeks ahead and I plotted out my projects and the different deadlines that I have. And I was able to see what needs to be done now and what can wait until next week, what can wait until the week after. And then I was able to prioritize and start getting stuff done. And so at the, by the end of last week, things were looking up and I was able to take the week off and I'm really coming into this week refreshed. So that's that. So I told you last week that uh, I, I had an exciting announcement about myself and Icon. So no, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a keynote speaker this year, but I, I am having, I am holding a workshop there. So they do workshops before the conference uh, really starts in earnest and uh, I'll be hosting an in-person live full day Inky Maps workshop. So you know my, you may know my Skillshare class Inky Maps where I teach you how to create hand illustrated maps and or hand-ish illustrated maps. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to be teaching that as a workshop in person at Icon. So if you've taken the class and you want to like try it again in person, or if you've never taken the class, but you think you might find that interesting or you've wanted to, but maybe doing it live in person will be more motivating for you. And you're going to Icon, which if you're an illustrator, you should, you should go to Icon. Um, yeah, sign up. I, I don't know how many spots there are, but if you, if you, I think if you go to the Icon website or their blog, they just made an announcement last week and you can check it out. And I'll be sure to um, 
give you more information about that as it unfolds. So that's my that's my my big announcement about Icon. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. So I think that's that's all the the chit chat I have for this morning. Hey guys, um, you'll notice I'm wearing a different shirt. I'm recording this on a different day than the first part of this video. And that's because I created, I recorded the video, posted it, and then in retrospect, I realized the video was just not up to snuff. It really wasn't very good quality. I did a lousy job summarizing the question that was asked and, and then answering it clearly. And I really want to hold myself to higher standard than that. So I appreciate your patience as I kind of got my act together here. Um, but basically what happened was I was trying to just not be, I was trying to just, you know, get the video done and move on to the, the actual work that I have to do as an illustrator and not be such a perfectionist. But I think there are people who are good at doing one take and then there are people who need two takes to get it right. And I'm definitely of the latter persuasion. And um, I also do a lot better job when I do some preparatory thinking and a little bit of writing uh, before doing my recording. So lesson learned, here I am, I'm, I'm um, revising the content and I, I believe that it's gonna be a much better video, much better content for you guys. So here we go. So the question comes from Jess, she's a regular question asker. I'll come up with a better term for um, you guys when you're asking questions, but anyway, she's, she's a regular question asker so far in this series. Uh, she's got a lot in her original question, so I'm going to do my best to summarize it and answer it accordingly. So one of her main questions, I think, is about how to get the attention of art directors, whether in editorial, advertising, or publishing. And because I have way more experience working with art directors in the editorial and advertising worlds, I'll focus on that. So here's the question. How do you get the attention of an art director? What are the best methods to get in touch with art directors without being a weird, cold emailer? Perhaps put yourself in an art director's shoes. They're not just sitting there waiting for emails from illustrators looking for something to do. They're busy with at least a handful of various projects, probably splitting their time between concepting, designing, meetings, sourcing new talent, directing current talent, scouring stock photo and illustration websites, and trying to win small battles with their creative directors. So, uh, of course, they're also definitely always on the lookout for new talent, but it's not typically the ones trying to get a hold of them that they're looking for. They're already finding their favorite illustrators on Instagram or in social media, blogs, Pinterest, magazines, because cream rises to the top, right? All the elite illustrators are already getting all the attention. So art directors will know about maybe say the top 100 illustrators who are doing work for the New Yorker, New Yorker and New York Times and Wired and all those big, you know, Google, all the big um, companies. So art directors sort of have a hierarchy of who they know about and really love, they're fans of certain illustrators, and then who will do kind of in their place if, if they can't get them. So most of us are, you know, sloppy seconds, sloppy thirds, and you know, that's okay. There's plenty of work, uh, there's lots of good work lapping up the crumbs under the table. There's one twisted and perverse way of jumping the hierarchy or skipping the line, uh, and that's having a connection. So if you do good work and an art director knows about you, almost regardless of how full your portfolio is or um, how elite your work is, they'll assign you something at some point. You may be a nobody illustrator at present, but you do good work. And because art directors are quite busy, they will immediately think of you when something comes up that they think you'll be good at. And because of the connection, I think they'll have a hope that you'll be willing, able, and on budget. Um, this has happened to me so many times that it's, it's likely the reason that my, uh, for my early success. Um, I had a lot of connections with art directors 
kind of mostly at local agencies. It doesn't matter how I made my connections. My story is very specific to my own timeline and situ situations. The important thing is that I was making good work, not just good in my own eyes, but you know, I, was, I would hear from other people, I'd have encouragement in, in some of the work I was doing, so I, I had a sense of what was working and what wasn't. Um, so I was making good work, and then meeting lots of people in the industry. So you may not have a direct connection to an art director or the art director you want to have the connection with, but you have connections to some people somewhere with some kind of job that you could be doing. So it might be right now you have a friend who has a company and they need some kind of illustration for their website or maybe they have a feed an Instagram feed and sometimes they like to put creative work up there like maybe you can ask a friend if you can do an Instagram takeover for them and, and do illustrations for a week or something like that but every person you do work for or reach out to is a connection to all their connections right I mean that's the whole I think that's the whole basis of social media is um, for every Facebook friend you have they have 300 to 500 friends and on it goes. I think LinkedIn is the most obvious example of that where they show you how many connections each person has and how many of those connections you share. You may not have a connection to an art director directly, but every time you do creative work for someone and get it shared or, or connected to different people, is this statistically you're, you're going to come across someone who makes decisions path and they're going to want to get in touch with you or at least they'll have you top of mind if you do end up trying to connect with them at some later point. So personally I was meeting a lot of people in my industry and I was going to conferences setting up informal visits with studios and agencies and generally trying to be a person at local creative events. Um, <clears throat> of course I was also putting myself out there online. I was keeping a current portfolio and keeping a blog, doing whatever I could to get my work featured on other blogs, um, creating self-initiated projects. And this actually leads to one of Jess's other questions about making up our own assignments. I'll get to that in a little bit. But to summarize my current point, there are two ways to get an art director's attention. You can be a top illustrator or you can have a direct connection to that art director. The most likely kind of Jobs that you'll do at first are with people within your immediate circles. Once you do enough of that kind of work, if your work is strong, you'll start hearing from people beyond your circles and you'll start doing more interesting work. Okay, there's a third way of getting an art director's attention and that's actually catching their eye with a physical piece uh, that you've made and sent to them. So in my own case, a well-designed letterpress postcard has done the trick over and again. But what works for me may not work for you. Think about the kind of illustration you do and then imagine the best possible format to send it in. Um, maybe it's a zine, that might be cool, or your, or your own bound lookbook that you make on Blurb. And um, if anything, the art director is going to feel bad about throwing it in the recycling bin because it's, it's such a heavy piece of um, collection of paper. But, but it, you know... It goes beyond the postcard. Think beyond the postcard is what I'm saying. Even if it's just like something special about that postcard. I can tell you that most glossy postcards with an average or above average illustration that came to me when I was working as an art director, um, they ended up in the recycling bin. And it's, it's not that the work was bad. It's just that I wasn't tuned into the frequency that these postcards were trying to dial into, if that makes sense. They were answers to questions I wasn't asking. And if someone's, like for instance, if you're listening to me talk right now, but you, you haven't been wondering about any of this, you're prob this is probably gobbledygook to you. Similarly, think about the question that an art director might be asking. Think about the need. Think about the, the, the world they're in, the things that they're paying attention to. And then honestly ask yourself if what you're going to send them is on the right channel, is the answer to their question. Don't just pray and spray, sending out hundreds of postcards indiscriminately to all kinds of agencies and studios. 
it's far more effective to single out a few companies that make work that you feel has overlap with your own work. In such a case, by all means, write the art director an email with a link to your site and succinctly introduce yourself and say as much. Okay, so onto self-initiated projects. I've, I think I've spoken about these before in other videos, but Jess asks specifically if it's looked down upon to include self-initiated projects on your own portfolio site. And I'm gonna say that if that's all you have, if all you have are self-initiated projects, then you have to use them. Whatever you have now, that's what you can work with, right? And there's absolutely zero, no shame in that. Um, once you start getting more professional work, uh, that once you start getting more professional work, you can start shedding the, the sort of spec projects that you made. And maybe some of those spec projects are so good that you want to keep them up. And I think the, the, maybe keep, keep this in mind, just because it's a fake project, it shouldn't look fake, right? The point of a fake is that it fools its audience, right? It looks like the real thing. So um, maybe, okay, so one thing that's important to note regarding self-initiated projects is that they don't have to just be pretend projects for dream clients. Um, they could be actual projects and collaborations. Um, so I think a lot of my reputation as an illustrator in my, in my own country, Canada, actually has been bolstered by my Canadian-themed letterpress collaborations that I've done with other illustrators. So back starting in, uh, a few years ago, maybe 2014, my friend Vince and I started creating postcards. We created a set of postcards by Canadian illustrators. We really went to town branding and packaging it and then invested in properly documenting it. So we took really great photos of them and then we got it out into blogs and stuff like that. And of course, cause it was a real product. These were uh, postcards that you could buy and send or give as gifts and beautiful illustrations on them. Uh, we made connections with retailers across the country who actually sold and ca carried and sold our projects, our, our products. We've done this over and again with different collaborations uh, I'm speaking specifically of my collaborations with Vince. And I think w imp the important thing to note is that these were, these projects were beyond just personal flights of fancy. They um, quite intentionally included other people, namely my industry peers, um, those people I felt deep admiration for. And, and each one of those illustrators in our collaborations have their own networks. So the project I created was me to the power of, let's say in the case where we did 10 illustrators, is me to the power of 10, to the power of however many connections those people have. So it's a very powerful way of creating self-initiated works by doing collaborations that become products that other people can either buy or that you give away. And um, another important point is that the benefit of this project uh, was shared among all the collaborators. It wasn't just my benefit or Vince's. He's the guy who printed the, the he's the letterpress printer. So the, he benefited from it by getting sales of products and having um, you know his presses running profitable materials, products. And I benefited, of course, by getting, I got to do an illustration for it and I got to get my work in stores and I got to connect with all these illustrators I love. And then, of course, the connections that my name would carry through their connections. And it was the same way. It went both ways, right? So the more you can connect, the more you can make those connections mutually beneficial, the more those connections will yield new and better opportunities. Um, it's a slow climb and it takes a lot of investment, but things like this pay off. Okay, so that's all I have about making connections to art directors and possible ways of building out your portfolio and getting more interesting and significant work. Uh, I know there's probably tons of holes and, and I'm, I speak in kind of hyperbole in terms of these limited ways you can get in touch with an art director. I know that there are subtleties and gray areas, but in general, this is the way I see it. And, and so this is the way I'm able to tell you guys. Jess has one last comment that I'd like to speak to and that's, that's this. So this is Jess talking now. I just want to say that it's impossible to find the answers to my questions online. 
Very few illustrators in my experience are willing to share this info. So thanks for being unique in telling us your experience. So you're very welcome, Jess. Um, and I'm in, I'm in, thank you very much for your, your compliments and your encouragement. That is um, amazing and important for me to hear so that I know that I'm making these videos for a reason. So I include this last bit, not to be self-congratulatory or to toot my horn, but to say I'm more than happy to share my experience like this. I had a really hard struggle through these, through these answers in my own journey. And I think we all will just naturally, like every illustrator kind of forges their own path and their own path is so unique from other people's. So there's always gonna be the element of not really knowing the landscape ahead. But anyway, there is also tons of experience to be shared and that's why I'm doing this. And I would encourage you, there are actually quite a few resources if you know where to look. So there's Andy J Pizza with his creative pep talk and he's kind of like the, the guy right now in my opinion. Like he, he's making amazingly relevant content that's helping illustrators learn how to be profitable while also making good art. And I think that's his whole thing. So if you haven't heard of Andy's uh, podcast, um, you've probably been hiding under a rock, but don't worry, I've, I've included the link, his link in the notes of this video, as well as all the other people I'm about to list. And uh, so there's Will Terry. Uh, he's here on YouTube and he's a children's book illustrator and he has uh, a, a rich resource of videos about all the topics that I'm talking about here. Um, and like things like pricing your art and, and getting a kids lit agent. I think he even has stuff on that, whether to work for free and he's into uh, comic cons and stuff like that. So he's a great resource for illustrators for sure. Uh, please check him out. And he's, he's a very experienced guy, super generous with his information. And then, uh, so there's a backlog of interviews on a podcast that's called Escape from Illustration Island. If you go to, I think it's illustrationage.com, uh, you can find it there. I think it's also on, on like iTunes and Spotify. Um, anyway, Escape from Illustration Island is uh, these amazing interviews that Thomas James has conducted with creative industry leaders that I don't even know how we got in touch with these people, but he's a great interviewer. And even though some of the, some of the podcast episodes go back to like 2009 or 2010, they're pretty evergreen. And I would definitely recommend you check out them because you're going to get a lot of insights into what these top leading creative directors are looking for when they're um, seeking out illustration talent. So there's Make Your Artwork, Make It Then Tell Everybody, Red Lemon Club, uh, and these are just a few that I've encountered over the years. And if you know some of your own resources that are helping, please share them with us and uh, share the love. Anyway, my name is Tom Froze. I'm an illustrator in Vancouver, BC. I love answering your questions about illustration. Your questions are the reason I'm here and really the only thing driving this content. You can find me online at tomfroze.com and of course on social media, etc. The links are below. You can find me on skillshare.com where I teach how to illustrate by combining analog and digital techniques. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. If you love all these videos, please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to hit a thousand follow, a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. So it's a pretty humble goal, but I feel like if I can reach a thousand subscribers by the end of the year, I will be encouraged. It means that I'm creating content that people are getting something out of. So that's all for now. Thanks for watching. And until next time, keep making good work and asking good questions. Have a great week.